To be to be talking to, and and when I when I mentioned earlier, there were kind of two kinds of programs that we kind of encourage folks to go to that are um, um, for people who really need that who really need that kind of socialization. And there's no other place to go. There's a so-called social model and a medical model, and Tammy, maybe you can just talk about the, the, that distinction. Sure. There's two models of adult day care, essentially. Social model is what I run. It's Pleasant Trees Adult Day in Marlboro. It's in a home, and it's a very small group of people. It's private pay, um, and insurance does not cover a social model. It's more for earlier stages of Alzheimer's, higher functioning individuals, where they're open to other individuals with memory issues, and it's a very forgiving and failure-free environment. Then there's the medical model, and in Marlboro there's um, a medical model, Aging Well, Adult Day Health. Insurance, um, Medicaid does cover that, and they provide medical care, hands-on care, everything from medication management to showering and bathing, um, and it's all about the socialization, so both programs Get the individual involved in activities and conversation and having nutritious meals and just getting together with other folks. So there are the two models um, for adult day care. Thank you. Can you just roll? GCM, yes. Geriatric care manager. GCM, geriatric care manager. Can you just roll back one? Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, another thing that's starting to happen now is increasingly the, 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 the evolution of these part-time programs. And I know that that, that Tammy's been active um, with the program that is developing now in Hudson, where they're actually doing something right at the Council on Aging. And it's something that you may want to be talking to your own folks about, right? About trying to develop something where the program actually happens, the socialization programs happens right here. Just started in Hudson. I do a lot of work on Martha's Vineyard. And on Martha's Vineyard, there were six separate towns, and they've developed a part-time social daycare program that is, really, that is actually island-wide. It really takes advantage of the use of council on aging or of, uh, of uh, senior centers in order to do something like this. Uh, the only other thing I'm going to mention, remember, we talked about it as far as Frank and Mary are concerned. At this point, if you're Frank and Mary and you're desperately calling your lawyer saying, oh, I've got to do something, I have to get rid of my assets, you don't. You don't, right? Uh, if you're Mary and Mary Jr. and, and, you're, and this Al Alzheimer's is kicking in now and, and, and it's been a few years since you had done all of those transfers, then your goal, among other things, is to beat the clock, to try to see if you can avoid having to get involved with Mass Health until you've made it past those five years. Um, and and that's, that leads me to the last point, care agreements. At this point, if you're Mary and Mary June, um, and, you, and you have not um, done anything about protecting any of these assets, one of the things that you can do uh, is to enter would be to enter into a care agreement between Mary and Mary Jr. Through which, because Mary Jr. at this point, if Mary Sr. is really slipping, is probably spending a lot of time with Mary Sr. anyway. So you may want to develop, have a care agreement between the two of them through which Mary Sr. can pay Mary Jr. Uh, in that case, it's not considered to be a gift. So if later on Mary Sr. has to go to a nursing home, the money that she paid to Mary Jr does not disqualify her from receiving mass health. Just a couple of points about that, though. In order for that agreement to be valid, it has to be in writing. It has to be prospective. So it has to say, here are the things that I am going to do for my mother in the future. And it has to provide that the, th the services that are being provided have to be at fair market value. And then Mary Jr. needs to keep a record of the services that are provided. So, I mean, oftentimes I'll have this situation happen where Mary Jr. or someone that looks a lot like her 
is talking to me about the fact that she's been caring for her mother for the last four years, and now all of a sudden, Ma has really slipped to the point where she needs nursing home care, and oh, can't she be paid for all of the work that she did? Because otherwise, Ma's remaining $200,000 all has to go to the nursing home. The answer at that point is no. No, there is nothing that can be done. There is nothing that she can be paid. She needed to have a pre-existing written agreement documenting the work that was going to get done and then it had to get done. But in the course of figuring out what kind of work is appropriate and what the fair market value is, that is another very useful role for the geriatric care manager because they can come in at an early point, help you figure out what the kinds of services are that mom may be really needing or that dad may really be needing and that can therefore be built into this care agreement. So, that, so that's about what happens if, if you've got early stage. Next. Next. Th then the broader question, and we're just going to talk about this for a few minutes because I want to leave time for questions, is suppose you have advanced <coughs> beyond these kinds of early stage issues. What are the kinds of programs that are available that can keep you home? And I want to have Susan talk about them because BayPath administers them all, right? To the extent that you are receiving services either at home or even in the nursing home, um, either from the federal government or from the state government, they're basically based on what Bay Path Elder Services thinks you need. But I really want uh, Susan to focus on, if she could, mm -hmm. the possibility of actually being able to stay at home even though you are at a kind of a later stage in terms of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, great. So the, the, has, the Frail Elder Waiver Program is a program through Massachusetts for low-income seniors who are eligible to go into a nursing home but would prefer to stay at home. So it allows you to get the needed health care and support services at home. So that's in, for the Frail Elder Waiver Program. It allows for about six hours of services in your home. And to, before that, a, a basic home care through Bay Path is about three hours of services at home. And you can imagine that goes by pretty fast. Um, but we have another program, and it's called the Community Choices Program, which increases that amount of service up a, a lot. So this is a special program for frail elder waiver members who are at imminent risk of entering a nursing home, but again, would prefer to stay at home. Um, so it does allow for more services beyond the six hours uh, of just the frail elder waiver. Um, and I don't want to say it's, it's open-ended, but what happens is uh, the nurse from Bay Path works with the case manager that is assigned to you, and they work as the nurse comes out to do an assessment and decides upon what level of care is needed. So if they, if they say you need 20 hours, 40 hours, that's what you'll get. And the reasoning behind this is because um, the cost of nursing homes is a lot more than receiving care at home. So that's why they have this program available. And it's a program that most people are not aware of. I mean, to give you a comparison, I used that number that in the Bay Pass service area, there were about 138 <laughs> people that are, that are taking advantage of this enhanced frail elder waiver. There were about 20,000 people from that service area that are in nursing homes, mm -hmm. right? And Mass Health would much rather that you stay at home, right? But they, but they want, so can you just kind of talk about how you would figure out whether or not you'd be eligible. And the reason why I, I ask about this is, when you think about what it would take for you to send your spouse or yourself, right, or anybody you know, to a nursing home, you'd have to be really bad. I mean, because you don't want to be going there. You want to be staying at home. But that's very different from the standard, or the much lower standard, of what it would take for Mass Health to determine that you would be otherwise eligible for a nursing home and therefore to provide the services to keep you at home. So we're just going to talk about that. Sure, so there is the, the financial eligibility, which Arthur talked about, and then the uh, medical eligibility. Of course, this is all uh, determined by the, the nurse from Bay Path, but the first requirement is needing assistance with at least two activities of daily living, and those could be bathing, dressing, transferring from a, a chair to a wheelchair or, or from a bed. Um, so those are just some examples of activities of daily living and that's just two. Um, and also one skilled nursing need. Um, 
and examples of those, it could be even medication management, um, but it also could be needing uh, assistance on an ongoing basis, daily basis, with oxygen, if you're insulin dependent, um, a catheter, things like that. So it's one skilled need, which could be um, medication management or and in addition to the two um, activities of daily living. And on the bottom there, you see cueing and supervision. That counts. If someone needs cueing with, it's time to take your medication and supervision, making sure that they actually do take the medication, that, that counts. So, so the, the program is extremely broad. Now, I'm just going to talk about the numbers a little bit. Once again, remember, if you were Frank and Mary and you were in that situation, and Frank wanted to stay at home, and Mary wanted to keep him at home, right? And, and they wanted to qualify for this program, though, because they know, Mary knows, that she can't keep Frank at home unless there is a lot of home care coming into the home, and she knows that on their assets they can't afford it. Well, re well remember, next slide. That while, the, while in that situation, there are a couple of criteria. First of all, Frank's assets in that situation have to be below $2,000 for him to qualify. However, in this situation, the spouse's assets are not countable. So in that situation, Frank could literally ship everything to Mary and qualify the next day for all of the, pro all of the services that could be provided to him at home. His income but not hers, hers wouldn't count, would have to be lower than, what is, it was 2000, oh, it seems oh, to be this sorry, change. Yeah, it's 2130 The $2,130 a month. His okay. gross income has to be below that. But oftentimes, once you've shifted all of the assets to Mary, so that he does not receiving any other non-income other than his Social Security, he'd meet that standard. Next slide, please. If you have any questions on an ongoing basis regarding regarding the early issues about health and how to stay, how to reduce your likelihood of getting Alzheimer's. If you've got a kind of a question that you're wondering about and you really don't want to ask anybody you know because you're kind of embarrassed about it, right? Um, if you've got an ongoing crisis that's happening at the middle of the night, you know, you can't find your husband, where did he go, you know? Or you're, there's an issue, there's information, that you can always call the Alzheimer's Association. What, the other obvious resources are Bay Path Elder Services and here the Council on Aging. Through the Council on Aging, you can learn about any of these programs at any time. Thank you very much. Any questions?